going to mug me? I might get a mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Download Veely now. This is Mali, land of sand, salt, and nomads. Ever since I was a kid, I've dreamed of this part of Africa. But Mali is more than the Sahara. Its great river, the Niger, flows past unique cultures that reflect its legendary past. On the outskirts of Timbuktu, gateway to the Sahara, I'm Art Wolf. This is Travels to the Edge. Mali is a country with many different regions and distinct cultures. It's the seventh largest country on the African continent. Landlocked, it stretches from the subtropical Niger River Valley in the south to the arid Sahara Desert in the north. We're starting our journey in the rocky cliffs of the Dogon country. Then we'll descend into the lush Niger River Valley before heading north to the Sahara by way of Timbuktu. I'm exploring the Dogon country and the rest of Mali with our guide Amadou and with David Conrad, a scholar who has studied and lived in the country for many years. Oh, these buildings literally blend into this cliff. You wouldn't even see them from a distance. Think of the centuries it took for the natural stone to be sculpted this way. And then they had to, they had to haul all that mud up there. This is quite an inner sanctum, isn't it? The ultimate fortified Dogon dwelling, I'd say. This is really protected back in here. How did it happen that people would live here? I mean, isn't it easier out in the grassy plains? Easier, but not as safe. They came here originally fleeing slave raiders. They were not Muslims, and they were fair game for the powerful Muslim rulers of surrounding regions. And they came here to hide out. Hide out. We're in a Dogon village and the sun hasn't quite come up over the escarpment, so everything's bathed in soft light. And a little bit of the smoke, the subdued light, makes for a really artistic, very moody type of shot. I love the texture of this Dogon door, but also the texture of this older lady's skin. And they both tell a story of a harsh environment.
on to Kondagumu, a village renowned for its hunters. Birapo. 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 This feels like a very powerful place to me. When you kill an animal, you release enormous amounts of the spiritual power of the animal, and you have to be protected from that. So a hunter is, in a way, a kind of a priest because he has to have that protection from the spirit world and that communication with the spirit world in order to be successful. It's interesting to me that I've traveled in the Amazon and other places in Africa and throughout wild Asia, and there's this connection to the animals that are hunted, and there's a reverence towards the animals that they hunt, and often they are displayed. Yeah, they respect their prey, and they take into account the spirit of the animals that they're killing. We've hiked on to a neighboring village where we've been invited to watch a traditional Dogon mask dance. This is one of the great legendary dances of Africa. Can you tell me a little more about what I'm photographing? We've got the uh, dancers reflecting this pervasive spirituality of Dogon culture and also the amazing sculpture of Dogon culture, which is, of course, world famous. And the sculptures originated with their perceptions of these spirits that come out and dance the Dhamma or the funerals. And uh, they all belong to the realm of the, of the dead. heading down from the Dogon Cliffs into the Niger River Delta. Our first stop is the medieval mud brick city of Jenny. Because of its role as a hub in the gold trade, Jenny once rivaled Timbuktu in importance during the Mali Empire. Today, in the Islamic world of West Africa, it is still a very important city. This is really a beautiful mosque. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, it looks like it's five or 600 years old, but it's actually 100 years old this year. It was built on, in 1907 on the ruins of the previous mosque, and there have most likely been mosques here for five or six centuries. I love it. It's, it's got a beautiful organic shape to it. It's very much in keeping with Africa, isn't it? It's the texture of this part of Africa. The architecture is stunning, but seen within the context of the religion and all these people, it really comes to life, wouldn't you agree? It's just a definitive scene from this part of Mali. It's really nice to see all these people come pouring out of this building. Very vibrant, definitive example of the local culture here in Jenny.
We're moving on from Jenny along the Niger River. Everything happens along the river, from washing clothes, to washing bicycles, to washing sheep. And there's no better way to experience the river than actually being on it. In the whole scheme of things, uh, the Niger River is one of the bigger rivers in Africa. It's the third largest, about 2,825 miles. When the river rises, it just spreads out all over the delta, it creates a giant lake. When the river recedes at the end of the high water season, it deposits silt, so it's very fertile agricultural lands. The populations gravitated down here after 5,000 BCE. Uh, looking for a better way to live. Whoever was in power, this was absolutely essential to their prosperity because this was its great area for food production. This was the breadbasket of the Mali Empire. Who are these people, David? Well, they're called the Bozo, and they've constructed their entire culture uh, in, around the river uh, activities, the boating, fishing, and transport. Everybody is coming down and doing chores or washing their goats or bathing or even cleaning. What, whatever they've got, the river really is that kind of the focal point in activity. And, and we get to see, uh, get a real hint of their, their uh, cycle of daily life. So this is Mopti. Yeah, these are the boats that carry people and cargo throughout the Great Bend of the Niger. It's a very historic scene because this is the way they've been doing it for many centuries. What I'd like to do is try to find a place to maybe shoot these beautiful boats against the sun. and driving nearly a full day north to Timbuktu, the historic portal to the Sahara. Ever since I was a little boy, I've heard of Timbuktu. What makes this place so legendary? Well, it was the gateway to the Sahara and all the wealthy salt trade that went north from here. And Europeans always thought of it as the, probably the most isolated city on Earth. So what's happened to Timbuktu in modern times? Well, by the 17th century, the European traders had come down the Atlantic coast, so all the trade shifted southward, uh, and gradually the trade across the Sahara based in Timbuktu dried up. Leaving Timbuktu behind, we're heading far out into the Sahara with our mini caravan of SUVs. First stop, the historic oasis town of Arawan. You know, it's staggering to think that this Sahara, which is so sparsely populated, is actually the size of the United States. It's so huge, it takes up a third of the African continent. Wow. It's one of the biggest natural features on the entire planet. David, this is such a severe environment. It's really hard to imagine people living here. It really is. Uh, in fact, for a long time, the Sahara was thought of as a barrier between North Africa and Africa south of the desert but it was really a highway. There were highways across it. 
for, for the transport of the salt trade. The people themselves who were participating in it didn't think of it as a, as a barrier at all. Armies went back and forth across it. And now it's the land of the Tuareg. Berber people who originated in North Africa and they gradually established themselves as permanent residents of the Sahara Desert. They don't want to be anywhere else. These wells are spaced at intervals throughout the desert and that's how these nomads survive. It takes a local Tuareg herder to be able to know where they are, to find them. And if they don't find them, they don't survive. We've been invited for tea in the Sahara with a Tuareg family camped outside of Erewhon. Since Tomashek isn't one of my languages, our guide, Amadou, will be translating. In here, out of the sun, looks cool. Nice. Ah, oh, thank you. <coughs> Very good. You like that? Nice. <laughs> okay, look at it. Oh, it's so nice to be able to show the big picture. <laughs> These computers are a great way of connecting with people now. For me, it's fun to look at them too because it brings back instant memories. Tonight we'll camp Tuareg style in the open desert. Very traditional for the Tuaregs to sit around a campfire, share a uh, pot of tea, have a little meal, and go to bed for a long night because tomorrow it's the same thing. They'll get up, load the salt on the camels, and head on further south. what this animal feels with 160 pounds of salt on his back. Not too happy. This salt trade, which is centuries upon centuries old, still exists out here in the middle of the Sahara. To see these Tuaregs load their camels with blocks of salt, four blocks of salt that are 20 kilos in weight that have been cut out of an ancient seabed to the north in the middle of the Sahara. And they're bringing them south. And along the way, they pause. And now they're loading them up after a long night's rest. And they're moving on south to Timbuktu. <laughs> going to be trying to get that moment when the dust is flying, the sand is flying, the ropes are flying. It'll be very, very dramatic. There.
Wow, this is very, very nice right now. I've got great textured scent. In fact, you can always gauge a really nice situation by whether the shot looks great without the main subject. And right now, the sand itself is beautiful, but with camels, it's extraordinary. This is really intense working conditions. The sand is blowing, the wind is racing across the tops of these dunes here in the Sahara, but it's all worth it. I love the way that they're coming out of that sand dune. It's almost like they're materializing out of the sand itself. Wow, what a beautiful, timeless view. To watch a camel train cross the dune, it's like looking into the past. The textures, the smells, the sounds of the camels, all of it is playing into this experience. sun is setting over the Sahara right behind this camel train. Such a classic image. Such a beautiful image. Exploring Mali has been like visiting three different countries in just one small part of Africa. And within these widely different landscapes and climates are a multiplicity of cultures and people that have made me feel welcome every step of the way. I'm Art Wolf. Join me next time on Travels to the Edge.